Well, I invite you to take your Bibles and turn tonight to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs, and uh, what we're going to, to talk about tonight is the sin of laziness. I was asked to speak on that subject. And um, by the way, before we get uh, into the uh, message, it's going to be a topical, thematic message. It will draw verses from various passages in Proverbs. Uh, so we're going to have you bounce around. If you have a notebook and, and pen, you may want to jot verses down. Uh, if not, you may, you know, later on go watch it again and, and, and take notes. So uh, with that said, let me just say by way of introduction, the title uh, I think I can see of your series is Unfair Advantage. And before I even get into the text and start talking about it, let me just say this. If you and uh, uh, the workforce, and of course when you're young, you start out with your first job and and uh, you, you start your career and do things when you're uh, just getting going, I can tell you this. Uh, what is out in the workforce today is such that if you will show up on time, if you will do what you're told, and you'll give a maximum effort, you will have a great advantage over your competition as far as uh, someone who is out in the workforce and uh, trying to work hard and, and uh, maybe get a promotion. And so really, uh, we have a very serious problem in our society today, and that is an, a lower work ethic in many cases. And of all people who had, should have a good work ethic, it is the, the people who are the children of God. And so I hope that uh, laziness is not a problem, but if it is, we want to address that head on and address uh, soft choices and, and the weaknesses of our flesh. And just like uh, temptation, sexual temptation, or other types of uh, uh, times where we make soft choices and give in, uh, that uh, problem of laziness can be a, a problem. So let's address that biblically. And so tonight, I, what I want to do is the outline is going to be really simple. I mean, this is such a simple sermon. We're going to talk about the curse of laziness. And then we're going to talk about the causes of laziness. And then we're going to talk about the cure of laziness. I think you can remember that outline. But we've got a lot to look at. And I'm going to have you bounce around a great deal. So buckle your pew belt and let's uh, get into it. Now the very first thing I want to talk about is the curse of laziness. And I want to say that laziness, number one, under the curse of laziness, lazes, laziness causes poverty. Laziness causes poverty. Go to Proverbs chapter 6 and uh, look in verse 9. Actually, there's a larger unit there that we'll look at later on. But uh, Proverbs 6, 9 says, uh, How long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? By the way, my notes are in the King James, so don't uh, hold that against me. Uh, when wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber... A little folding of the hands to sleep. And now watch verse 11. So shall thy poverty come as one that traileth, travaileth and, one, uh, and thy want or thy lack or thy need as an armed man. So you want to know a, a major cause of poverty? It's laziness. And let me give you another verse. That's Proverbs 6. And verse 11, go to Proverbs 24 and look at verse 32 through 34. And the, the um, words are this, Then I saw and considered, this is Proverbs 24 verse 32. You may want to mark these passages in your Bible and just uh, maybe put laziness out beside it. And cross reference is a, uh, uh, just a lot of verses we're going to go over tonight. So Proverbs 24 verse 32, Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it, referring uh, again to a man who did not keep his fields and so forth and received instruction. We'll come back to those other verses. Look at verse 33, parallel to what we just saw in uh, Proverbs 6, uh, 10, and 11. He says this in Proverbs 24, 33, Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth and thy want as an armed man. I don't know if you realize that, but that verse then is repeated twice. And the poverty comes as uh, one that travaileth, and the want or need or lack as an armed man. Just rushes upon those who just are lazy and don't sleep. I mean, want to sleep and not get up and get busy. All right, put another verse down or turn to this one. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 13. 
Proverbs 20, verse 13, love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Lest thou come to poverty. We'll read the rest of that uh, verse later on, but here we see an association with laziness and poverty. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 15, slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. What is a major cause of hunger? Uh... Well, one of them, one reason, there are other reasons, but one reason is idleness, laziness, and the idle soul shall suffer hunger. That's Proverbs 19, 15. How about this one? Proverbs chapter 13, verse 4. The soul of the slugger desireth and hath nothing. Oh, there's plenty of want, plenty I wish I had, plenty of even envy, I should have what you have. Uh, plenty of I'm going to vote in order to get somebody to tax somebody to give me more free stuff. A lot of that, but still the soul of the slugger desireth, but hath nothing. How about another one? Proverbs 10, verse 4. He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand. Dealing with a slack hand is just not diligent. It's just goofing off. It's not being what a person should be. Uh, the counterpart of that in that same verse, but he, the hand of the diligent maketh rich. All right, so what's the first point? We're under the curse of laziness. And understand that Proverbs is, is a, a book that gives us principles, guidelines. And I want to say to you that if you are a lazy person, laziness is a fast ticket to poverty. That's the first thing that we see under the curse of laziness. Let me give you another that's going to have less verses here, but uh, let me say something else about a lazy man. It is the cause of unreliability. Unreliability. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 26. I I, uh, think this is an interesting verse. Listen to it. Proverbs 10, 26. As vinegar to the teeth. And as smoke to the eyes. Time out. That's neither one pleasant. Not pleasant to have vinegar uh, to your teeth and not have smoke in your eyes. You've been camping and had a, uh, somebody I won't remember at a campfire one time said, uh, I must look like a chimney. The smoke always follows me as I move around the camp. I mean, I move around the fire. The smoke just keeps blowing on them. We don't want smoke in our eyes. So as vinegar is to the teeth and as smoke is to the eyes, listen, so is the sluggard to them that send him. What is that saying? Just can't depend on them. They're unreliable. And by the way, in ministry, uh, you know, in leadership, we try to find good people that are ready to step up to the plate. But it is a heartbreak, a discouragement if we find that we've uh, entrusted someone with some task and they're not up to it. Maybe they're just not diligent. And that happens. And so it was a mistake to entrust them with that much responsibility. Sometimes a boss, an employer, uh, or maybe you just with a friend. Um, I remember a particular fella, not to, to be unkind, but uh, that kind of had a pattern of uh, not getting up on time. And uh, I was kind of desperate to find somebody to pick me up at the airport when I flew in. Well, I was remembering this verse as I was waiting over an hour <laughs> for him to get there. And so you guys have to be reliable. I want to ask you this are you reliable? I mean, if you say, I'll do something, do you follow through? Do you do it? You want to be reliable, but a a lazy person is sometimes quite unreliable. So it is the cause of unreliability. It's the cause of poverty. It's the cause of unreliability. It's the cause of inability. Uh, The lazy man really just can't do stuff, and the real reason he can't is laziness. Proverbs chapter 21, verse 25. Uh, Again, the desire of the slothful killeth him for his hands refuse to labor. I mean, he just doesn't want to make himself do it. And so there's inability. He says, I can't do it. And the real problem is he just won't do it. He just doesn't know how to move himself off center and get started. And then Proverbs 15, 19. Proverbs 15, 19. The way of the slothful man is as a hedge of thorns, but the way of the righteous is made plain. What does that verse mean as a hedge of thorns? Well, uh, that's showing difficulty and inability. The thorns, you don't want to go through the thorn bush. 
Uh, and so the man's own slothfulness has hedged him in and uh, prohi prohibited him uh, from doing things that other men might would do. And again, I ask you this, are you a person who basically backs out of responsibility? Says I can't do it, doesn't want to do it, doesn't want to get involved, and maybe it's a problem of laziness that just causes your hand not to be able to put it to the task. Well, it causes inability. It is also a cause of disgrace. A cause of disgrace. Proverbs chapter 10 and uh, verses 4 and 5. He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand. We saw that one already. But the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Verse 5. 10, 5. He that gathereth in the summer is a wise son. But he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causeth shame. And so you show me a son that uh, uh, is diligent, gets up, and even gathers the harvest in the summer. He's a wise son. But you show me one who even in harvest time is sleeping in. That son is one who causes shame and a disgrace to his parents. And you don't want to do that. You want to have a good reputation. You want to not bring shame and reproach to your family. All right, so now we're thinking there about, again, the uh, curse of laziness and the cause. It causes poverty. It causes unreliability. It causes inability. It causes disgrace. Now I want to talk to you about the cause of laziness. And this uh, is going to still right here out of Proverbs, and we're just bouncing around. And so I hope you're turning and keeping up. I want you to think of several factors, several factors that are uh, contributors to this cause of laziness. Number one, there is the sleep factor. You say, oh me, I hope you're not sleeping through this point. But uh, let me give you some scriptures on it. You would be surprised as we're going to go over it how many verses address sleep. Now I know that if you're young, your body's growing and you need more sleep than I need. I mean, I, I don't need to be growing. <laughs> I'm through growing and hopefully I'm not growing out. But uh, uh, you're growing, and some of you, even if you're even younger, your bones are growing still. Some of you are beyond that point, but uh, so your body does need rest. Teenagers need more rest sometimes than, uh, than older adults. I understand that. Get your rest. Eat right. But don't let sleep be a problem in your life. Listen to what these verses say. Go back to Proverbs chapter 6. And listen to verse 4. I'm going to go ahead and read the whole unit uh, right here. It's got a lot of verses on sloth and, and being lazy. Uh, listen to it. Proverbs chapter 6, verses 4 through 11. We've already given some verses out of some of these things. But uh, let me just uh, zero in on the part where it's talking about sleep this time, okay? Proverbs chapter 6, verse 4. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Deliver thyself as a roe, that's like a deer, from the hand of the hunter, and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. Fowler, the fowler is someone who's uh, out to catch birds. Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. How long, verse 9, how long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands of the, uh, to sleep. And then he finishes, we've read it, so shall thy poverty come, as one that travaileth, and thy want as an armed man. Now we've read 10 and 11 already, but uh, he says, give not sleep to thine eyes, verse 4, nor slumber to thy eyelids. Verse 9, he asks the rhetorical question, how long wilt thou sleep, O sluggard? Oh, friend, sleep is a, a problem. It's a factor. And uh, it's repeated. That's Proverbs chapter 6 and uh, verses 4 through 11. Proverbs chapter 24 again. Proverbs 24, we've already looked at it. Verse 33, uh, forgive me for the repetition. But again, it says, yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands of sleep, so shall thy poverty come as a one that traileth, travaileth and thy one as an armed man. So we've repeated now these verses several times, but notice the emphasis there on sleep. How about Proverbs 20, verse 13? Listen to this verse. Proverbs 20, 13. Love not sleep. Love not sleep. Boy. You serious, Brother Sherwood? Well, I didn't write the Bible. I'm just reading it. Love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Open thine eyes, and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. Open your eyes, he says. 
Love, not sleep. Obviously, we love sleep, I think. Uh, and there's a sense why you're sleeping. It's not to say that you can't enjoy it. But you get the, the message here is that don't let uh, your love for sleep become such a thing that it is inordinate and it is actually laziness. And so you have to open your eyes. You have to get up. That old alarm clock, you need to set it. And you need to go ahead and get up. Sometimes you might snooze it to death or just throw it out the window. But get up. Love, not sleep. How are you going to do that, by the way? You probably have to go to bed earlier. You're right? You just have to, to prepare yourself and uh, be where you need to be. All right, Proverbs 26. Listen to this. This is a fascinating verse. Proverbs 26, verse 14. It's talking about the slothful. Verse 14, as the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful upon his bed. Well, what is that? A door has hinges and it opens and it closes, so it kind of flips there. And so just like that, someone is rolling over, they're on this side, and they roll over and they're on this side. And so the slothful man, he just keeps, oh, well, he's getting sore on one side, he's sleeping so long, so he's got to roll over. And so the, the Bible says, as the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful upon uh, his bed. How about Proverbs 19, verse 15? Slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. So again, sleep is a factor mentioned right here uh, by Solomon right here in the book of Proverbs. And um, again, I hope you do have a good sleep when you are supposed to sleep, but not more sleep than you need. Proverbs chapter 10, listen to it. Proverbs 10, uh, again, verse 5, we've Alluded to this, but listen to what it says. It says, he that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causeth shame. So there again, sleep is even the problem here. And so there's a time where a person should be working harder, a season called harvest time. And harvest time, the crops are in, you're going to let them spoil. You better put in extra time during that time and not be sleeping in late. And that's the time to even rise earlier and to work later and to get less sleep. You make up that in other times. So listen, what is the cause of laziness? Very frankly, one of the causes is too much sleep and too much love for sleep. And again, I know that I'm speaking to young people who actually do actually need, in some cases, more sleep. So be careful, though. Be wise. Don't be unwise. Understand, and if you're staying up and your eyes are getting red because you're looking at your phone and you're watching things, you're doing too much other stuff, go to bed in a timely way and get up in a timely way where you can do what God would have you to do and you can do it well, but don't let sleep be a factor and sleep cause you to be lazy. Now, not only is there the sleep factor, but there is also the fear factor, the fear factor. Listen to a couple other Proverbs and what it says. Proverbs 26 and... Uh, Verse 13, Proverbs 26, verse 13, the slothful man saith, there's a lion in the way. A lion is in the streets. Well, what's that all about? Well, it's an unreasonable fear. I, I think that uh, Solomon would not have given this if it were something that were legitimate. I mean, who's going to go out and, and run out in the street if there really is a lion there? Okay. We're not denying that you need to protect yourself from a ferocious beast. But Solomon is saying that the slothful man makes this as an excuse. The slothful man says there's a line in the way. He's not going to go out and go to work. He's not going to get busy. He's not going to get to put his hand to the task. After all, there's this uh, lion that might be out there. That is repeated. That's uh, Proverbs 26, verse 13. The exact same words are uh, repeated in Proverbs 22, verse 13. And so, again, it says the slothful man. This is Proverbs 22, 13. The slothful man saith, there is a lion without. I shall be slain in the streets. I said it's exactly the same. It's not verbatim, a little nuance in the words. Same idea. He's concerned, he thinks, inordinately. Uh, he has a fear. Or really, perhaps it's an excuse. And so that's not why he's going to work. Uh, we're in Proverbs. I'm going to slip a, a verse out of Ecclesiastes in there. Is that okay? Let me give you a verse out of Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 4. I think this is a marvelous verse. He that observeth the wind shall not sow, 
And he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap. There is an excuse there. There is someone who's worried about the weather. And uh, he is either concerned that, oh, well, you know what? I can't plant because it's just not going to be good. The weather's not going to be right. And so he's just really looking out, watching the, the weather. And maybe he's afe- afraid of, uh, of it not uh, working out. And maybe he thinks that I shouldn't sow because after all there's going to be a storm and it's going to wash up the seed or I don't know what he's thinking. But uh, there is this excuse mindset that's rooted into a fear mindset. And then when he doesn't sow, guess what? The end result is he also won't reap later on. And so what is the point? The point is, dear friends, that uh, we have to not make excuses. We don't need to have inordinate fears. We need to be disciplined. We need to apply ourselves to the task and go get with it. Now, sometimes you might do work, and it might be that a storm messes it up. It might be that things that you try to do doesn't work out. But I'd far rather put in the effort and the attempt and work hard, and then something happened that's part of God's providence than uh, just to wash out and fail because I didn't get up and get with it. Amen? So we need to not be a fearful people and an excuse-making people. So there is the sleep factor. There is the fear factor. Next, there is the comfort factor. The comfort factor. Uh, And listen to Proverbs 20, verse 4. The sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore shall he beg and harvest and have nothing. (laughs) Oh, boy, it's just too cold out. I don't want to get out. (sighs) Makes me feel cold right now, but I'm not really cold. But anyway, uh, you know that, um, you know, I'm going to break something to you. I, I think you know it, but in case you don't, after the curse, after the fall of Adam and Eve, God cursed the woman, and then he cursed the man. Do you remember the curse? You remember what he said to Eve? Now before, by the way, he told Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. What's that mean? Have babies. Have children. That's good. What did he tell Adam? He put Adam in the midst of the garden and commanded him to tend to it and to work it. Now, he told Adam that before he even created Eve. So what's the point? First of all, work itself and childbirth itself are not curses. That's fine. Work's not a curse. The fact that we have to work is not a curse. The fact that uh, women give birth to babies is not a curse. So what's the curse? You read Genesis 3 very carefully. The curse for the woman was pain in childbirth. And the curse for the man was pain in his work. Pain. He said, by the sweat of your brow shall you eat. He said, thorns and thistles, the plants now will prick you and stick you when you go to tend them and harvest from them. And so I have bad news for you. Life's full of pain. It's not easy. Work is not supposed to be fun and games, and it's not easy. And especially when you're starting out. uh, Now, we do everything we can to mitigate the pain factor. We have air conditioning. We have power tools. We have all kinds of things that help us with the pain. And our ladies, they have things to help them with pain and childbearing. There's uh, medications and epidurals, and I'm all for that, happy Hopefully, uh, giving birth won't be too hard, but, uh, but it's painful. I mean, uh, uh, by the way, girls, you know it's much harder on the guys than it is on the girls, right? You know that? Okay, I'm just kidding on that. Uh, <laughs> just teasing. Obviously, I have no idea what I'm talking about on that, so disregard that point. So, uh, but uh, there is the pain factor, and, uh, but uh, when it comes to comfort, obviously, it's tempting to make soft choices. You know, as a, as a preacher, obviously the type of ministry I do, what I do now and teaching and, and preaching and all of it, it's, it's work. It's a different kind of work. It's, it's mind work. It's study work. It's, it's getting in and reading. It's, it's looking up things. It's typing up stuff. It's writing up stuff. And it's work, I promise you. 
Rightly done, ministry is work. But I didn't always do that type of work. I remember my first jobs and how much hard manual labor I've done. I think every young man ought to start out doing some good hard manual labor. It will help him. Uh, it is good for you. I have had jobs where we had to get out in the cold. In the early mornings, we're building a house, and I mean, it's frozen ground, and we've got a barrel with scrap wood in there, and we go warm our hands up, and then we're trying to put concrete. It's too cold to lay the concrete, so what do we do? We have other things that we'll do, and we finally get a warm enough day to, to put the, to the foundation in, and we start out of the ground, you know, building the stick building, and, and, and just hard manual labor, and when you're the young guy, you've got older guys, and you're the young guy that's unskilled labor, you do most of the hard, hard stuff. I mean, they say, you boy, go get those boards, and tote them over here, get that wheelbarrow, bring me this thing, and you're just work, 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 and it's uncomfortable. It's cold, and then in the summertime, it's hot, and you're burning slap dab up. It is good. Let me ask you this. Are you willing to be uncomfortable? Well, the slugger didn't. He won't plow because it's cold. And some, sometimes we just don't want to get up in the morning. Our room's cold. And, of course, I think now with central heat and air and carpet, maybe you don't feel that way. But when I was a boy, I remember our house and the floor was cold in the morning. I didn't like it, getting up in a cold, cold room and we, I didn't have a heater in my room. We'd go into, uh, I'm in the south in the country, and we'd go, uh, the other room had a stove in there, but my room was cold. I didn't want to get up out of bed. It's so much nicer to stay under those warm covers, amen? Uh, so, um, but there is the comfort factor. So that may be a problem. So laziness, again, there is the sleep factor. There is the fear factor. There is the comfort factor. And then there is the effort factor. Uh, listen to this passage, Proverbs 19, verse 24. Again, a slothful man, this is very unusual, by the way. A slothful man hideth his hand in his bosom. So he's putting it right here. And will not so much as bring it to his mouth again. I think this is hyperbole. I mean, come on. Are you telling me you won't even feed yourself? Well, that verse is repeated, or the idea is repeated. That was Proverbs 19, 24. Again, it says this, a slothful man hideth his hand in his bosom and will not so much as bring it to his mouth again. Listen to Proverbs 26, verse 15. Very similar verse. The slothful man hideth his hands in his bosom. It grieveth him to bring it again to his mouth. That's pretty pitiful if you ask me. Uh, but it, this is just, it takes too much effort. And there are folks that just won't even take care of themselves in the most minute way. I think, again, this is perhaps hyperbole, but it's a repeated verse, and it may express how bad it can really get. Are you willing to exert yourself? Put forth effort? Listen to another verse out of Proverbs Proverbs 12, verse 27. The slothful man roasteth not that which he took in hunting. Let me read that again. The slothful man roasteth not that which he took in hunting. So he's gone out on a hunt. And he's got his bow and his arrow. And there goes a deer. Oh, that part's fun. But now you've got to go and dress it. Now you have to go and skin it and gut it and cut it up and haul it out of the woods and carry it back to the, to the home. <sighs> yeah. He's got fresh meat for him and his family. He just killed it in hunting, but he's so lazy, he lets the meat spoil and doesn't even bring it in. By the way, that is a... Um, that's an offense, at least in my home state of Arkansas, with the Game and Fish Commission. You hunt something and kill it, you better not let that meat waste out there. You'll get a fine from the game warden. That's poor stewardship to let that meat spoil. But the principle is beyond that. Some of you say, well, Brother Sherwood, I'm not going to go hunting. Okay, <laughs> uh, perhaps not. But there's a principle here. Uh, not following through. And you just even are... Our, uh, uh, we're going to see another verse in a little bit. Uh, well, right here, the next one coming up, Proverbs 18, 9. Uh, he is also that is slothful in his work, is brother to him that is a great waster. 
See, the guy that lets the deer just lay there and rot or the turkey or whatever he just hunted and won't clean it and won't dress it, he's a great waster. He just doesn't want to put forth the effort. And so, again, I just want to ask you personally, think in your own life, is there something in your life you just say, you know what, you're not following through. You're not, you've, you've signed up, you're in a course at school, and you're not following through and doing the work for it. Or maybe there's something in your vocational work, and you're just not following through, and you're, you're actually being a waster, waster of opportunity, waster of what you have before you. And it is an effort. Again, work is called work because it takes energy. Did you know the, the Greek word for work is energia or energe? It's the word, word we get our word energy from. And so to expend energy, effort, so the slothful man doesn't expend the energy and he doesn't roast even what he took in hunting. The slothful man, he who that is slothful in his work is brother to him that is a great waster. Again, that's Proverbs 18, 9. Listen to another verse. It doesn't mention the sluggard or the slothful, but it's a, it's a principle, I think, that relates under this point on the effort factor. Listen to Proverbs 14, verse 4. Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increase is by the strength of the ox. Now, what's that verse saying? Let me read it again. Proverbs 14, verse 4. Where no oxen are, the crib is clean, but much increases by the strength of the ox. So if you got an ox, well, that's great. If you've got an ox, man, that is a capital investment in Bible times. That is an animal that will pull a cart, a wagon. It'll pull a plow. It will do work, and you have to feed him, and you have to clean up after him. But my goodness, what a, a, that's like a big tractor. It's great to have an ox. But on the other hand, if you don't have an ox, you don't have to clean up after him. The crib's clean. There's no manure to shovel out of the barn. And so the, I think the sluggard is, ah, well, I don't want to have to mess with that thing. I'm going to get that. I have to clean up after it. I have to feed it. I have to care for it. I'm not going to bother it. The effort factor kills that. But if he would have that investment and care for that investment, there is much increase. There's prosperity with the ox. All right, now then, so there is what I am saying as we're thinking about the causes of uh, laziness. There is the sleep factor. There is the fear factor. There is the comfort factor. There is, bless you, dear sister, there is the water factor. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, uh, oh, that's wonderful. There is the uh, fear factor, there is the sleep factor, there is the comfort factor, the effort factor. Let me give you another one, the foolish factor, just being a pure fool. Listen to these verses. And the, and the fool, by the way, and I'm not going to uh, chase fool throughout the, the Bible. Maybe you've already had a sermon on that since you're going through Proverbs on being foolish. Uh, it's a good topic to trace through the book of Proverbs, but... Uh, Proverbs 26, verse 12, listen to this. Seest thou a man wise in his own conceits? That is, in his own estimation. Ah, he thinks he's so smart. There's more hope of a fool than of him. And then he continues. The slothful man saith there's a line in the way, a line in the streets. As the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful upon his bed. The slothful hideth his hand in his bosom, it grieveth him to bring it to, again to his mouth. And then it says, verse 16, the sluggard is wiser in his own conceit. That is, he's wiser in, in his own estimation than seven men that can render a reason. And so sandwiched uh, there in Proverbs 26, verses 12 through 16, sandwiched with all those verses about sloth and, and sleeping and and being afraid of a line that in there and all of this kind of stuff, sandwiched in that is these verses in verse 12 and 16 that talk about a man's own estimation and being foolish in it. And he's wiser in his own estimation, it says in verse 16, than seven men that can render a reason. So you've got somebody, uh, he's got friends, and, he's, and their friend says, listen, you've got to quit sleeping in. You've got to get, you, you know, why are you doing, and they try to help him out. And maybe seven people, a pastor even comes up. He knows more than everybody. He will not listen. He is so foolish, he's hard-headed, and he thinks that he knows more than anybody. And, and his mom and dad can't tell him anything. 
His brother or sister can't tell him anything. His grandparents can't tell him anything. He is going to do well what he well pleases. And that is, again, uh, an aspect of a cause of laziness or a, a corollary with laziness. He is uh, full of himself and will not hear correction. I hope tonight if you need to hear this in a, a form of correction that you need to modify your behavior if you are one that is being lazy and not diligent that this will be a correction to you and you'll be wise and hear the word of God and hear the man of God as he preaches the word of God tonight and realize that laziness is dishonor to God it's a sin before God and we dare not uh, claim to be Christian and walk in a lazy way now again we're still thinking about the foolish factor and so uh, another aspect of the foolish factor uh, is not only just being stubborn and, and thinking you know more than any of your counselors. Another foolish factor is uh, uh, maybe just I think I can get rich, get rich quick and not, I don't have to work hard to get rich. I, and, and this is uh, what I would call the get rich quick scheme mindset. Listen to Proverbs 21. 21. Proverbs 21 verse 5 through 7. Well, mainly just five. Look at verse five. Proverbs 21, five. The thoughts of the diligent. Now that's the antithesis of a lazy person. The thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness. plenteousness. But of everyone that is hasty, only to want. Now, my last name's hasty, so I don't want to be that. But uh, we spell it different, okay? Uh, but what is this? Somebody who just... Uh, uh, Thinks, again, I think you're going to see in another verse uh, that is hasty to try to get rich. Uh, let me show you that other verse and see if it doesn't tie in. Proverbs 28, verses 19 and 20. It's very similar, and I think you'll understand what he's talking about back in Proverbs 21, 5. Listen to it. Proverbs 21, verse 19. He that tilleth his land. Now, what's that? Tilleth is cultivate the, the ground. He's going to plow it up. And be ready for planting and, and putting in uh, uh, the seed. He that tilleth his land shall have plenty of bread. You want to have plenty of uh, bread? Grow wheat. He that tilleth his land shall have plenty of bread. But he that followeth after vain persons, he that followeth after vain persons shall have poverty enough. Verse 20, a faithful man shall abound with blessings. But he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. And so, you know, the way that we uh, are to prosper is hard work. And whatever that uh, avenue of work is, whether, again, it's blue collar or white collar, that's not the point. The point is it's work. But you can uh, just be hasty to get rich, and that is not going to be good. And it, it'll only lead to want, as Proverbs 21, 5 says. And so some people are just foolish. And they have the mindset and the attitude, well, I don't have to do it like everybody else. I've just got a shortcut. Listen, that's not right. You work, and you do the best you can, and, uh, and do it unto the glory of God. And let me just say that my old pastor used to say this about work. Adrian Rogers used to say this. He said, your work is your platform of witness. And it is your altar of devotion. You do your work unto the Lord. You do it to the glory of God. And it will be a testimony. It will be a, a visible testimony. It will show the character of Christ in you. And you serve your employer, and you do it humbly, you do it faithfully, you show up on time, you do your best, and you do hard work, and you do your classwork if you're a student, and you, you do it as unto the Lord. And it will be a platform, and it will say something about you that will be different about what it says about other people. And as a Christian, you have a humble spirit, a hardworking, diligent attitude, a mindset that is a, a, a can-do, get with it, and it will bring glory to God, and it will be a witness to a lost world. But uh, so there is, dear friend, though, these causes 
of laziness. So there are corollaries with it. So there's the curse of laziness. The curse of laziness, it causes poverty. It causes unreliability. It causes inability. It causes disgrace. The cause of laziness, there's the sleep factor. Do you love too much sleep? There's the fear factor. Do you make excuses about things that are, are not reasonable? There's the comfort factor. Don't want to get out of bed, it's too cold, and, and I don't want to do work when it's too cold or too hot or too whatever. There's the effort factor. Work takes work. It takes energy, and uh, the lazy person doesn't want that. And then there's the foolish factor. The person cannot be corrected. He will not hear, and he won't listen to seven men who give him a reason. He's smarter than they all. And he maybe even tries to say, I've got a better plan. I'll get around it, and I'll get rich through my own schemes. Now, let me give you a last point, and uh, you're listening well. So let me talk to you not only about the curse of laziness and the cause of laziness, but out of Proverbs, I want to talk to you about the cure for laziness. The cure for laziness. Listen to uh, these verses, Proverbs again, chapter 6, and uh, look in verse 4. We're looking at some of these we've already looked at, but I just need to take it from a different slice and uh, point out some different a aspects here. And so let me just say this, cure of laziness, you need to learn the value of time. Learn the value of time and the value of awake time, of being awake. He says in Proverbs 6, 4, notice that some of this discussion about sleep here is actually imperative commands. Proverbs 6, 4, give not sleep to thine eyes. Now that's not saying you can't sleep. Obviously we understand that you have to have sleep. But if you're sleeping too much, quit it. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. That's Proverbs 6, 4. Listen, let the next verse. Deliver thyself as a roe, that is as a deer, from the hand of the hunter, and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. So you need to, to get up, and if you'll get up and not give sleep to your eyelids, it's as, it's as if that uh, you're getting, you're being very wise when you do that. You're delivering yourself from something that would otherwise harm you and overcome you. You're delivering yourself as a deer who's running away from a hunter. Or you're delivering yourself as a bird who's trying to be trapped by the hand of a fowler. Then he says this, verse 6, Go to the ant, thou sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. So verses 6, 7, and 8 are talking about the ant. And so the imperatives here is you, you wake up, you deliver yourself, and also observe the ant and be wise. Just look at the nature. And by the way, you've probably done it. I certainly remember as a little boy looking at ants on an ant hill, and I'm going to confess to you that I had a magnifying glass, and yeah, it wasn't pretty. Uh, science fiction, I was like laser phasers shot from spacecraft above, you know, burning those little ants on the fire on the mountain. All right, so never mind. But uh, you ever look at those ants? It's pretty amazing, isn't it? How hard they work. They're diligent. They uh, have little particles of food that they, they get that even are bigger than their own bodies and they're hoisting them over their head and they're, and they're just little like interstate highways. They're just running back and forth and they're just carrying this back to the, to the nest. Consider the ant. Verse 7, he doesn't have a guide overseer or ruler. Okay, we know that there's queen, queen ants and all that. That's not uh, to contradict that, but basically Solomon is saying though that uh, in, in its instinctive nature, there's they just do. And it's the application to us is no one standing over you, making you. You've got self-initiative. You're the one that gets up in the morning. It's not because your mama still tells you to get up. I mean, you're, some of you in your 20s, is your mom still said, get up, get up, get dressed. You got to come to church tonight or today or whatever. Hopefully that's not the case or get up. You've got to, uh, by the way, my mother used to have to get me up when I was a kid. Boy. But there's a point where we need to get up ourselves. 
There's a point we need to have self-starter initiative. And we put our hand to the task of whatever God's given us to do. And no one's making us. You have a job, it shouldn't be that your boss has to threaten you and say, if you don't you know, follow through, I'm going to fire you. You should say, I'm going to do it. Your teacher, you're at school. Does your teacher have to hound you to do the work? Obviously, when you're in college, they don't care. I mean, you just fail. You're paying money. And you either do it or you don't, right? Uh, but uh, maybe if you're younger and, and in high school or junior high, or uh, we've got some of our students here, and they're blessed. I'm so glad some of them are here, uh, good young people. But you uh, want to have self-initiative, not someone riding you and making you, in, and that's part of maturity. And so, again, he says, verse 7, which having no guide or overseer or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. And then uh, we already talked about this verse, Proverbs 20, verse 13, love not sleep. And then he says, open thine eyes. You may say, well, Brother Sherwood, this is not the cure for laziness. That's my problem. What I'm trying to say, though, is you have imperative commands. Now, we're going to get to where we have the spiritual power to obey. But if there is an issue, the first thing we need to realize is that God's word just says, open your eyes. That's exactly what it says. Proverbs 20, verse 13, love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty, open thine eyes, and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. Now, there is a principle there, uh, but implied in that is that this is something you and I are supposed to do. So, there is to be the value of time, the value of being awake, the value of being wise, and uh, if you need to, he, again, he says, observe the ant and uh, consider uh, her ways and be wise. So learn the value of time. Do you squander your time, again, sleeping? Or do you, maybe you squander your time in other frivolous things. Obviously, you need recreation. Obviously, obviously you need downtime. You understand, though, precious friend, that in our culture today, we have far more luxurious uh, opportunities. We have far more time... Uh, that can be used in uh, recreation, uh, you need to be a good steward of that. There's okay to have that to a point. That's fine to a point. But there is, uh, you also should have things that are uh, part of your uh, service to Christ that is labor and work. All right, uh, let me give you something else. Not only the value of time, learn the value of diligence. Now, part of that problem we said uh, was it just takes effort. Uh, it's it's a, a comfort factor, an effort factor. Remember we talked about those causes. Well, listen to what the Bible says about the word diligent. You'd be surprised how many verses we're going to look at real quick that talk about diligence. Let me just do it. Let me just give them to you real quick. And some of them are, are parts of the other verses that we've read already, but I want to focus now on this mandate or, or this principle about being diligent. Proverbs 13 verse 4 says this, the soul of the slugger desireth and hath nothing. But now listen to the other half. But the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. So be diligent. That is that you'll have an abundance. Proverbs 10, and by the way, spiritually speaking, we could apply that. Proverbs 10 verse 4, he becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. All right, Proverbs 21, verse 5, the thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness. Or how about this, Proverbs 27, verse 23, be thou diligent. Now listen to this one. This is Proverbs 27, verses 23 through 27. This is a unit here that's going to talk about diligent, and it's going to be uh, five verses on it. So listen to it. Or turn to it. Proverbs 27 verses 23 through 27. He says, Be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks and look well to thy herds. All right, so here's somebody that's uh, raising sheep. He's got herds, he's got cattle or whatever, livestock of some kind. He says, Be diligent to know the condition of these. Look well to them. This is looking well is another poetic way of speaking of diligence. He continues, verse 24, for riches are not forever. So just don't think you can rest on your inheritance. Don't be presumptuous. You now have this stewardship over these flocks, over these herds. Be diligent with that. 
Look well to that. Riches are not forever. And doth the crown endure to every generation? Don't assume it. Verse 25, the hay appeareth, and the tender grass showeth itself. The herbs of the mountain, the herbs of the mountains are gathered. The lambs are for thy clothing, and the goats are the price of the field. And thou shalt have goat's milk enough for thy food, for the food of thy household, and for the maintenance of thy maidens. Well, you might say, well, Brother Sherwood, all this is agriculture. I don't have any sheep. I don't have any cows. And I don't intend to have any. Well, you understand there's an application, don't you? There's an application of being diligent with whatever you have. And perhaps it's something you've inherited. Perhaps it's something you've been entrusted with. And make good use of it. And it uh, is a capital. Again, this is uh, sheep and... and uh, Sheep and uh, cows and whatnot are capital investments. And that could be even just in the form of the money that you have or things that you, you uh, again, inherit from your parents or whatnot. And uh, again, he says lambs are for clothing and the goats are for the price of the field. There, there's a capital value with this. But don't assume just because you have something. Maybe you have an automobile and maybe you work for it or maybe it was handed to you. And that's fine. Okay, uh, riches are not forever. That doesn't mean it's going to always run. You may need to be saving up for the next car. You have to be ready and be diligent. And so you'll have enough. He, he finishes that out in verse 27. And thou shalt have goat's milk enough for thy food and for the food of thy household and for the maintenance of thy maidens. And so if you are diligent, you will be able to make uh, profit with the capital that you have. You take care of what you have, and it will have value and maintain its value. And again, as our title is, you'll have an advantage. Now, people today are covetous, and they say, well, it's not fair if you have advantage, or if you have advantage from your parents. Or, no, you want to actually pass on advantage to your children. Every loving parent who's responsible should want better for their children than they even had for themselves. And I hope that you'll be good parents and you will try to, to uh, the Bible, by the way, it speaks of, the, of a, a righteous man having an inheritance even for his grandchildren. And so you ought to try to work toward that end if it's possible. Uh, don't resent that if you don't get it. If your grandparents came from the former Soviet Union, communism took everything they had. And they came to America probably... Uh, scratching and clawing and uh, sadly we're living in a nation today that uh, politically is drifting towards socialism and it wants to take what you have and not let you keep it and tax you to death and redistribute it and give it to lazy people who aren't working that's not biblical it's not right I need to move on so Proverbs 22 verse 29 uh, listen to this Proverbs 22 verse 29 talking about diligence now you're, if you want to correct laziness learn diligence and he says this, uh, verse 29, See thou a man diligent in his business. He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. Mean meaning here lowly men. That is, you, you, you're even, let's say your, your work is uh, a craftsman. And you become a great craftsman. And you, uh, your work and your skills are cultivated and you're diligent in that. And guess what? Uh, in Solomon's day, he's saying you'll stand before kings and not just for, before ordinary pe people. That, this is how to move up in a career trajectory because you just outwork and outdo the competition. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 24. Uh, it says this, the hand of the diligent shall bear rule. But the slothful shall be under tribute. Under tribute, that is paying tribute to another uh, nation. And of course, uh, that could be said about America. Uh, there was a book written a number of years ago by a man who's dead now, uh, a man named Chuck Colson. Maybe you've heard of Chuck Colson. He was a, uh, uh, a Christian evangelical and writer, and he wrote a book, Why America Doesn't Work. And he talked about the loss of the work ethic. And he was writing about that in a Christian perspective. Have you ever heard of the Protestant work ethic? Even a sociologist, a German sociologist, um, uh, Max Weber, wrote a book. I forget the year. It's been a century ago. And the book was titled The Protestant Work Ethic. 
Uh, we've had uh, recent years, we've heard the campaign slogan, Make America Great Again. Well, the first thing is to make America godly again. Uh, but also part of that would be make America go back to its Protestant roots and have a Protestant work ethic. And I'm talking now, I trust the brothers and sisters in Christ. And I'm especially now addressing the men, the young men. You need to be able to care for your family and have a good work ethic. Whatever vocation you're in, whatever vocation you will be, you need to do all you can do to work hard and provide for your family. Now, I've got to, I don't even know what time I'm supposed to end. What am I supposed to end, uh, brother, uh, brother Peter? Past time? Am I late? Laziness on my part. I've got to get moving. All right, so uh, let, me, let me finish it up. You're listening well. I've got more I can say besides Proverbs, and I might get to it. We'll see. I don't know what the, we were late getting started. We're probably late getting out of here. Let me give you a few other things on diligence, and I'll, I want to make some other application, though. Ecclesiastes says this. Ecclesiastes 9.10. Whatever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. For there is no work, nor device, nor wisdom, nor knowledge in the grave whither thou goest. And so while you are alive and draw your breath and have the strength, and especially that you have the strength of youth, whatever you find to do, if it's worthwhile, you sign up. You say, all right, I'm going to sign up and I'm going to do this for the church. I'm going to do this for bright youth. I'm going to do this for the Lord. I'm going to take this job. I'm going to uh, enroll in this class. Whatever you find to do, Christian, let me tell you, do it with all your might. Don't do halfway. If you're going to do it, do it all the way or if it's worth doing. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing right. If it's not worth doing right, it's not worth doing. So maybe you don't need to sign up for everything. Sign up for what you're supposed to sign up for. But when you do, do it. Amen? And now, again, uh, we talked about the man that didn't roast what he took in hunting. Let me give you that verse again, but the second half of it. Proverbs 12, 27. The slothful man roasteth not what he took in hunting. But the substance, that is the material things, of a diligent man is precious. So he takes care of what he has. Do you take care of what you have? So what is the correction and the cure for sloth? And for laziness, well, there is the uh, learn the value of time. Learn the value of awake time. Not just time sleeping, but time awake. And then learn the value of diligence. Be a diligent person. And now let me give you another one. Learn the value of proper priorities. You know, you also have to prioritize. You can't do everything. Uh, and maybe, maybe part of the problem for some people is not really that you're lazy, it's that you are overcommitted. Now, you need to be committed. I don't know that that's always the problem. A lot of times folks who are lazy just, uh, they don't want to sign up and they don't commit and they're non-committal. We say, will you sign up and will you volunteer? Will you do? No, why not? We can't get folks to be committed and they won't sign up. And that's a problem for some folks. Other folks... They're overcommitted. You know that it's said, I don't know about the Slavic churches and uh, in the Pacific Coast Slavic Baptist Association. I don't know about Bright. I don't know about the other churches in the area. But in the Southern Baptist churches, back when I was younger, they had a statistic, and I'm thinking it probably hadn't changed. And here's what that statistic said. They said 20% of the people do 80% of the work in the local church. 20% do 80%. Having pastored and been senior pastor of churches in the past, I can testify that you will have a handful of people that will work and work, and they're doing everything. They're teaching the Sunday school. They're cleaning up the, the, the office. They're, they're the, the bookkeeper. They're doing everything they can in service of Christ, and they're always doing something, and they're wore out tired, and they're overtaxed, and then other people aren't doing anything. And you say, well, why is that? I don't know why that is. I think that there's spiritual factors, and we can get to that. But, uh, but uh, maybe there's somebody here that's overtaxed. Maybe, again, there's others that need to sign up and go to work. But one thing you need to understand, you're going to have to prioritize. You, you need to have the proper priorities in life. And, of course, we want to put God first and your family right there. Your, if you're married, your spouse and your children 
uh, but your church life and, of course, your work life, spending time on social media and spending time uh, in entertainment come way down on the priority list. Listen to this passage, by the way. Proverbs 24, verse 27. And I think it's a very interesting one. It says this, Proverbs 24, verse 27, prepare thy work without and make it fit for thyself in the field and afterwards build thine house. Now, is there wisdom in that? Well, of course it's wisdom in it. It's God's word. Let me say it again. Prepare thy work without. What is that saying? Well, you need to line up your, your job. You need to figure out your source of income. You need to do that and get lined up for that. He says, prepare thy work without and make it fit for thyself in the field. So if your agricultural uh, environment and your work is in the field, you need to get that lined up. Then after that, build your house. Now, it's good to build you a house. And uh, the Bible's not against that. But even before you build your house, you've got to line up your income. And so some of you as young people, you're in a stage Right now, maybe you'd like to go ahead and, and buy that jet ski, or maybe you'd like to spend money on that uh, gadget or whatever, or that, the new iPhone thing, or whatever you want, and, and that's not in and of itself wrong per se, uh, but you, uh, you need to get your priorities right and make sure, though, that you are lining up your work and maybe even investment for future income. And that is a part of having proper priorities. And then Solomon continues, and listen to this. Uh, in verse 30 he says I went by the field of the slothful now by the way the, the diligent man and the good man the man who's got the right priorities he's prepared his work he's made it fit for himself in the field but, but Solomon contrasts that I think here in verse 30 he says I went by the field of the slothful and by the vineyard of a man void of understanding and lo it was all grown over with thorns and nettles and uh, had covered the face thereof, and the stone wall thereof was broken down. Then I saw and considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. And then he goes into his dialogue about sleep again. Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands of sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that travaileth, and thy want as an armed man. We've already addressed the sleep issue but what you have here is a guy that just doesn't even have good priorities. And he's not taking care of the field. And Solomon says, I went by that field. I went by the field of the slothful. And by the vineyard, that's where they grow the grapes, right? I went by the vineyard of the man void of understanding. See, a slothful man is lacking wisdom. He's void of understanding. What did it look like? It was all grown over with thorns. He didn't weed it out. Nettles had covered the face of it. It's grown over. It's, it's smothering out the grapes. It's smothering out whatever else was in the field. And even the stone wall thereof was broken down. What's the stone wall? Well, that's going to keep maybe the foxes out or other animals from coming in there. And he hadn't repaired that. He's just letting it go, collapse and just wither down. Not taking care of what he has. Solomon says, I, I saw it. I considered it well. I looked upon it and received instruction. Then he sees also sleep as a problem for this sluggard. And so you need to prepare your work without, as he says in verse 27. Make it fit for thyself in the field. Then after that, you can take care of, of your house and you can take care of other things. You need to have the right priorities. Now, that is Proverbs. Now, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. I've got other things I could tell you out of the New Testament. I, uh, maybe I should just close with a couple things. Can I do that? I'm going to make it quick. I think you ought to hear it. Listen to the word of the Lord out of the New Testament. And I, and I want to say this, that uh, the New Testament reinforces a, a high work ethic and it condemns idleness. 2 Thessalonians, you might put this down or turn to it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 6. Now we command you brothers, this is by the way to the men. And I do believe it's more the men. I do believe that a woman's domain 
Titus 2.5 is workers at home. I don't have time to address that. Uh, and I would like to, but I don't really have time to chase that rabbit. The Proverbs 31 woman worked very hard. She was diligent. Her work was from home and for her home. And it had to deal with food, fabric, and fashion. And finances. And uh, we could say more about the wonderful woman in Proverbs 31. We're going to find out, though, the Bible says, if a man does not provide for his own, he's worse than an unbeliever, an infidel. And so men have a special stewardship responsibility in vocational work outside the home. But listen to this passage about brothers being lazy. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6. Now we command you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother who is walking in idleness. What's idleness? That's laziness. Just not doing what he should. And not in accord with the tradition that you receive from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us because we were not idle when we were with you. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with toil and labor. We worked, note that word worked, toil and labor. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. Now, it was not because we do not have that right. What's he talking about? Well, Paul elsewhere tells us that the minister has a right to receive uh, uh, compensation for his ministry, and that is taught. But he, he's going to do say, we, it's not because we didn't have right. He says, I wanted to be an example. Look at it again, verse 9. It's not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. Verse 10. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. Now, this is not optional. Here it is. Here is the uh, benevolent program for the New Testament church. Are you ready? Even when we're with you, verse 10, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. I do believe, by the way, the Apostle Paul couldn't have voted Democrat. You said, you spoke politics. Yeah, I don't know that he could vote Republican all the time, but voting to take money from hardworking people, redistribute it to people who are being lazy and will not work, is unbiblical. Let me say something else. It's also unbiblical for church ministry. You might have someone who, uh, they're living in sin, and I'm, I'm not hard-hearted, but... Uh, they're being lazy. I'm not saying if they can't work. But you know, the last thing you need to do is hand that guy on the corner a $20 bill if he's just being a bum. He needs to grow to be hungry. Hunger will correct that. I was uh, back when I was doing construction, and I could tell you a lot of stories, and I'm not going to take the time to do it. I promise you, I could tell you a lot of stories. One. There was a fellow who had his little cardboard sign, we'll work for food. My foreman was in the pickup truck driving. I was sitting beside him. I've been working hard. He's working hard. We had to run fetch something. And there was this guy on the corner. And we stopped. He rolled down his window. He says, hop in. I will go to Burger King right now and get you a burger. I'll give you a cash paycheck. Or not a paycheck. I'll give you cash money at the end of the day. Hop in and we've got a lot of work to do. Come join us. The guy said, no, thank you. Oh, thank you. Don't be, don't, don't give folks cash. Now, maybe there's an exception, but I can tell you too many times I found out the hard way. I just bought them a six-pack of beer. And uh, again, I, I think church ministries, we have to be careful about just being unwise and just handing out God's money to folks who are, will not work. Verse 10 again, for even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to do their 
work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note, or King James, mark that person, mark that man, and have nothing to do with him, that he may be ashamed. But do not regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Listen, folks, it is serious as it can be if you are a man who's supposed to be taking care of yourself and you're just a lazy, idle person. Last verse, promise, 1 Timothy 5, 8, but if any does not provide for his relatives, and especially for the members of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I could give you more, but listen, you've got a responsibility. I'm sorry, you were born into a world and in that world, you have a responsibility, and that's to work and to feed yourself. It's not my job to feed you. It's not our job to feed you. It's not society's job to feed you. It is your job, and you need to step up and be a hardworking man. Now, again, there's a different thing we could say about the ladies and the role of the ladies, but all of us should not be lazy. We should be diligent in whatever we do, whatever God's called us to do, whatever our sphere or domain of service is, do it and do it mildly and don't be lazy. Now, the last thing we're fixing, pray. You say, I don't hear any gospel message in that. Well, let me give it to you now. You're not going to do that well in the flesh. Your flesh wants to pamper yourself. Your flesh wants to to gratify yourself, your flesh, like my flesh, like all of us, is just going to give in and be soft and do what feels good and whatever you want to do. And, and you're not going to be victorious over laziness and get up and fight sleep in, in the flesh. You've got to be a spirit-filled Christian who's motivated to do everything to the glory of God. And you won't do that if you're not born again. And you need to be saved. And you need to realize that you're not your own. You're bought with a price. And I guess uh, uh, the first fundamental thing is understanding the lordship of Christ over your life. You don't belong to you. If, if you belong to you, you can do what you want. If you belong to you, sleep in. If you belong to you, beg people for handouts. Just do what you want. Steal if you want to, if you belong to you, right? But you belong to Christ. And there's a God who created you, and he has authority over you. And there's a Christ who's your Lord. And if he is indeed your Lord, you submit to him, you live for him. And so maybe tonight what you must do is bow to Jesus Christ as your Lord. Because if you're your own Lord, you do anything you want to do and justify it. And that's no good. And you'll wind up in hell, and you'll be uh, wiser in your own eyes than seven men who can give an answer. So maybe tonight, somebody here tonight may need to repent. And turn to Jesus Christ as their Lord. Would you bow in prayer? Let's stand together. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. The lesson's been very practical. It's been about not being lazy. If you're struggling with that and you are a Christian, I want to ask you to just talk to the Lord in a moment, even right now, and confess it. Say, Lord, I've not been a good steward of what God you've given me. I'm squandering my time. I love sleep too much. I'm not diligent. I'm worried about my comfort. I don't want to put forth the effort. I'm struggling. Just confess that. Go to the Lord with that. Ask him to help you with that weakness in your flesh. And then maybe some of you, again, maybe somebody tonight needs to repent and trust Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the good news of the gospel that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that if we will repent and trust Christ, that you will forgive us of our sins. You will give us your Holy Spirit. You will change us and make us different people. And we won't be like this lazy, sin-sick world that wants to justify themselves, wiser than seven men that can give an answer, pat themselves on the back, roll over and go back to sleep. No, we'll be a, a people that uh, is spoken of in the book of Daniel when you said, the children of my God shall do exploits. That is, we'll rise up, and we will take a stand, and we will be excellent in what we do. And whatever we lay our hand to do, we'll do it with all our might for your glory, for we belong to you. We're not our own. We've been bought with a price, and we understand that price is the precious blood of Christ. And so, Lord, tonight we purpose 
right now. We drive down a stake in our life right now and saying, we realize that our flesh is soft and weak, but Lord, in our weakness, you're made strong. And if we'll be dependent upon you, walking in your spirit, we can be a diligent people. We can be a people with a work ethic. We can be a people that makes wise use of our time. And so, Father, we ask that you would do that amongst this precious body of young people tonight, that you would raise them up to be exceptional Christians, not conforming to this age, not conforming to that in our culture, but they would stand out, and they would stand out and that they would be witnesses for Christ, not only verbally with their testimony, but also by a life that is marked and incredibly different from what is around them. And Lord, I pray that you'd keep them from just raw money motives. And certainly we understand it's fine to be prosperous and you give us wisdom and principles that we may grow in prosperity. But, but Lord, life is more than that. It is giving you glory. It's living for your purposes. And Father, I pray that you would just instill a deep passion in the heart of each one to that end, that we would live for you, for your glory. Again, Lord, if there's anyone here tonight that's not truly saved, may they fall under conviction even now and be brought to repentance and saving faith. Be glorified in the remaining time of our service. We humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.